Welcome to the very first Muscle Intelligence Q&A recorded at MI40 in Tampa. Very exciting. Ben, thanks for having me. Ash, it's been great to have you here. We have some great conversations that should probably be recorded before we hit record, but hey, you know, next time we'll, uh, we'll get the controversial ones on audio as well. Maybe. I'm, I'm a little bit fired up. I'm kind of excited, but I guess we can, you know, some things are maybe better left for recording. I, I think... As we further our thoughts in those particular areas, yeah, that's true. We will clarify our opinions and our logic, and we can we can let those fire, and we'll leave people hanging on that. Interesting, controversial topics that we don't disagree on necessarily, but it's always nice to to hear different opinions or, or different perspectives mm -hmm. on really really interesting conversations. So I have some, as I mentioned, I have some really good friends here. That's unfortunately I didn't get the drums for the conversation yesterday, but. I have some really good friends who just bring up really interesting topics that you know, maybe most people aren't aware of, and then to talk about those to people that actually have an interesting perspective, an unbiased, relatively unbiased, intelligent view, it's just so invigorating to me to have a great, stimulating conversation. I think one of the things that people that brings people to your podcast too is whatever the topic of the conversation, whether it's controversial or not, and you could argue that literally anything about food and, and nutrition and training is controversial because people always have opinions. But the thing that brings people to your podcast is that you are willing to talk about it from every angle and you're also willing to bring people on, as you said, that maybe if not completely unbiased opinions, but have educated, fact-based information to bring about a topic. But do you think it's possible, because we're talking about controversial opinions, and I'm thinking about that post that um, Gabrielle Lyon posted on Instagram about game changers. I don't know if you saw it. You probably haven't seen it on Instagram. It was basically just sort of her well-positioned rebuttal to the game changers. And, you know, you can go look at it if you want or not, if you're kind of over the whole topic. But she had probably like 600 comments to this post that she made, which I thought was well put. Like it wasn't something that maybe people hadn't seen before. It was just well articulated. But one of the things that people were kind of blasting her for, the, the vegans that kind of descended on it and didn't like what she had to say, was saying that she was herself biased because she promotes this protein forward, meat based diet, and that it's impossible to approach a subject like this without emotion and bias. And one of her arguments was that James Cameron, who's the guy, you know, James Cameron is, he put together this documentary because he's invested in this massive pea protein company. And so, of course, he's he actually? Like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That. And so then and Arnold's here's, got his new ladder. There you go. And it's probably, yeah. There you go. And so that's why he's putting the documentary together. And some of the vegans were saying, okay, that's well, totally but here's the argument that they're making. They're saying, okay, he is being pretty open about his bias by saying this diet has changed my life. I feel strongly about the health benefits. I have all this money. Feeling strongly is fucking bullshit. I don't give a shit if you feel strongly about something. I want to see like real factual information. See, there you go. And that's what that's what Gabrielle's saying. She's saying, yeah, I, well, first of all, she's not selling a protein bar, so there's that. But she's saying, I'm a doctor. I'm not here to make people less healthy. These are the facts. This is the science that can back up what I'm saying. These guys just want to sell a vegan, like a pea yeah, protein. I don't even want to talk about that today. Yeah, that's fair. I, I will that's throw fair. my I think we talked the last time. My opinion of that movie was terrible. Real bad. Yeah. For the amount of money and resources those guys had, they did a terrible job. The choices they picked to substantiate the argument were just sad and, and bad. And my kids were sitting there asking, Dad, is this, is this real? Is this like a vegan species, vegan or vegetarian? I was like, guys, if this is all they've got, I always said this last time, I was literally hoping they had something in that movie that would go, wow, that's actually a really good point. I'm not anti-vegan, man. Like, in no way am I like, oh, those people are bad. Hey, man, if that makes you feel better, go for it. But I'd like to have somebody actually come up with a really, really strong argument that says, other than, hey, this made me feel really good. This is actually why this is better for you. And to be honest, the logic that I see shows me that meat seems to be better than vegetables. But I think there should still be both. I think, like, you know, okay, I won't say that. That, that didn't sound correct. The argument against veganism is better than the argument against carnivore. There's more reasons to not be a vegan than there is to not be a carnivore. I think it all ends in one I like vegetables. I like meat. But veganism seems to be much less 
being an exclusively vegan, I'm only eating vegetables and, and vegetable-based products, seems to have more negative health implications than exclusively eating carbs. Mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah, and we don't have to get into this, but I think one of the things I just wanted to bring up because I thought it was interesting is the idea of an unbiased opinion because I'm pretty sure that's impossible. No, I don't think so. Like, I think there's certainly people out there who, I don't give, I'm not attached to the outcome. I have no emotional attachment in either way. And this is why I think people like this podcast is because I'm not dogmatic about anything or very few things. I'm dogmatic maybe about the fact that I think most people should lift weights. But other than that, very few things. And I would love to just generally see someone come out with some objective data that says, hey, if you have this genetic predisposition, eat this way. If you have this gene you know, mutation, this way. That's what I would love to see. And we're not far away from that. That's the beauty of it. If all these a-holes would just remove their bias and just look at the data, we could go, hey, man, you have this SNP. Eat more of this food. So when I do my DNA and compare that against my organic acid test, I can definitively see that I need more riboflavin, I need more magnesium, I need more methylation. I can see that on both of those. That tells me what my genetics is saying matches what my body is telling me. Now I can say Ben needs to eat these particular foods. We can't be far away from that being the standard, right? And I'm not attached to whether it's coming from this or that. As as my body is getting it, but I have what I need. Not everybody is as able to detach their ego or their emotion or their personality from the decisions that they make though like I you know coming from a journalism and like a writing background and there's a lot of talk in the, about to media be and there's also like the very intelligent exercise I think everyone should do when you're trying to argue a point which maybe the first step should be don't don't bother just give up like don't argue with people because life's too short but the real thing to do is to argue both sides it's like debate one-on-one, right? Because you have to understand what yeah. your opponents believe right. or think or what their totally. good points are. Most people don't want to do that, but it's so difficult with these things that people take so personally to remove their sense of self from the decisions that they're making. It's really, really difficult to do that for most people. You maybe not as much, but... I, I, yeah, I get it. But I think people have a hard time removing emotion from everything. That's the conversation we just had. It's like, for whatever reason, human beings have emotional attachment to all this nonsense that in no way benefits them but they become emotionally attached to it because for some reason they feel they should have an opinion and their opinion matters and what matters is a positive outcome not what you think about or how it makes you feel like i don't care how you feel tell me the objective outcome like is this making you better or is it making you worse that's the objective outcome and i think that i'm not yeah, no attachment to emotion you can tell things are a little feistier in the old podcasting studio this time because i've been in the gym just getting super jacked up on my own natural testosterone because <laughs> I just finished a muscle camp, my first muscle camp. And I want to talk about it a little bit, but first I actually want to do something that we've never done on the Q and A because I think it would be nice to do. We just talked about this offline, which is give some love to people who are leaving reviews and stuff. Yeah. Us. And we get so many great and we definitely should highlight them every week we should we get lots of great comments on social media we get comments on itunes which let's be honest is where it kind of matters the most because that's how the algorithms work the more people can leave us nice reviews the more people are going to see the podcast and it's going to grow so what i wanted to do was read out a review from itunes and what we're going to do we'll do this regularly if you're cool with that ben is read out a review and if the person who wrote it is listening and hears it they can send us a dm to muscle intelligence podcast on instagram and we'll send you a care package of treats and presents for being awesome. Does that sound good? Do it. Okay. New All right. Judge. Okay. So let's see which one I like. All right. I like this one because the name is Blah Blah Girly. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to pick some of these instead of you guys. Are Listen, you gave it to me. You gave it to me. And that's the thing that I, I mean, again, I'm going on all sorts of tangents today, but I've been so impressed since I've joined and I've been paying even more attention to the demographics of the podcast and the people who are listening and taking the time to respond is that it's way more women than I expected. Yeah, yeah. You know, I should know better, but I was like, I'm impressed by how many women are willing to kind of go down the meathead route and see yeah, what happens. that much of a meathead uh, anymore. Uh, a little bit. All right. So, blah, blah, girly <laughs> says, Ben's mindset helped me be the person I am today. He says, I've been following Ben's podcast for years now through the muscle expert and now onto muscle intelligence. I appreciate that he shares his knowledge, not only living a healthy life, but really focuses on mindfulness, the way he sees the world with such clarity and how he shares his experiences and knowledge make me so grateful to learn his perspective and attitude towards being the best person one can be. That's what I'm constantly working on. 
thank you then. So yes. your head's a little bit bigger thank, now. Thank you, good one. You, thank you very much. <laughs> you, I was actually expecting to be like one of those we just hadn't vetted this yet, and so we yeah, just call like, them this out. This is so garbage. Well, <laughs> if you scroll down a couple, there is one that says, I love Ashley. So oh. we'll give that person a present <laughs> for being awesome. But anyway, so if you hear your review, we really, really do appreciate it. It actually does matter a lot, and I know it's annoying to be asked to do this, but you know, if you take a second out of your day, it makes a big difference for the podcast. So... Thank you for doing that. Send us a DM and we'll give you some stuff. All right. So I'm going to do my typical, it's a rant, but I get a lot of people who are coming to me. Yep. I get a lot of people who are coming to me for mentorship lately. And the biggest thing it seems that entrepreneurs lack is clarity and the ability to focus, right? So when we have 10, 20, 50 things on our plate to do, it's very difficult at times to focus. We have this unconscious FOMO, right? We have this unconscious fear of missing out. So we started one thing and we go, oh, what's happening over there? And then we're doing something else. Oh, what's happening over there? I better go check my Instagram. I better go check my email. And it's very easy to get distracted. So my approach to ultimately being disciplined and getting shit done is relatively simple. And I work backwards from what I want to accomplish in six months. And I say, okay, well, what are all the things? Let's say I want to have 100 coaching clients in six months. So that's my goal. And that's just whatever. I just picked that off the top of my head. So I make a list, I put that top of my list and I say, well, what are all the things I need to do to make that happen? And I write down this huge list and it's, it could be like, hey, I have to create systems, I have to create documents, I have to create funnels, I have to create landing pages, I have to write sales copy, I have to write emails, and all, whatever happens, you have to hire a manager, I have to do all these things. I may have 20, 30, 50 things in that list. And then I just create an order and I say, okay, well, here's all the things I need to get done. Do I have people in place to help me with those? And then I can write the person's name beside it. And if I don't, maybe I'll hire somebody. And if I am going to do it myself, then I literally just create this six-month plan. Okay, well, what are the first steps I want to do this month that are going to immediately lead to me being able to take a step closer to actually having this goal accomplished in six months or for three months or whatever the timeline is that you give yourself? And it's really this, you know, set a goal and create an action plan. It's so, so simple, but it literally takes sitting down once a week on Sunday for usually give myself 90 minutes to two hours maximum and just reverse engineer the entire process. I highly suggest starting you know, three to six months out so you give yourself enough time. And when you break it down that way and you go, gosh, for me to get this done in six months. And so a lot of my goals, to be honest, are revenue goals. And I say, hey, I want to make this much per month or this much per day. And I go, okay, well, what do I have to do to do that? It looks so much more attainable rather than going, oh my goodness, I have no idea how I'm going to get this you know, financial goal in six months. And you break it down into a way that is step-by-step oriented and you chunk it down. It's almost like, man, I don't really have that much to do. Like I only have these little incremental bites that I have to knock off the list. So that's basically how I approach it. So I get a lot of entrepreneurs who say, hey man, how do you stay focused when you have so many things to balance? That's it. So I only allow myself to have six top priorities uh, and they could be really anything. So it could be, you know, I'm launching a new podcast or I'm launching a coaching program or I'm doing a supplement brand or I'm doing writing my book and having all these priorities. And then it's just doing the exact same process for all those priorities, creating a team or creating an a action plan for each of those things. And I know exactly what I need to do on a monthly basis. And then I do that, you know, I have only these things that I have that I can do in the month of November or the month of December, whatever it is. And then I literally knock one thing out per day, where I just keep knocking at this. And I, and I just keep subdividing that list of priorities. So when I have my you know, 30 to 50 things to do in a month, and I go, okay, what are my top six? And I only ever just keep knocking it down to the top six. And I don't work on anything outside of that top six. Once I knock one thing out of the top six, I bump something up into the top six. It's really that simple. And I don't know if that was a good explanation to give you guys kind of some action items, but this is a massive one that everyone seems to suck at staying focused and organized and getting shit done. But it really has to start with this wide lens and go, what do I want to get done? And how do I hit my financial target? And then whittling it down to what are the you know five or six things I can do today. And if you don't finish all five or six, that's okay. Push till tomorrow. But you can keep that active list of only five to six things, which is a lot more attainable than having this massive list of 700 things to do, which you know you can't get done, is overwhelming, you end up doing nothing at all. So just a simple explanation of how I approach it. And I'm happy to share that with you guys at a deeper level if anyone wants to maybe we'll do a podcast on it sometime if people are interested. 
you guys can send us a DM and let us know or send us a message. But if that's something you guys are struggling with, feel free to go ahead and, and drop us a note and let us know. And I can even bring, bring another expert on to talk about that. Related to that, someone asked you a really good question on Instagram. And it's about optimizing your brain, but in a very specific way. So one of the things that really stuck with me the most from the muscle camp, and it's something maybe I've heard from you before. It's, it's certainly not like a completely original statement, but it stuck with me in the context of the work we were doing was how stuck human beings are on hard work and more work and doing more and more and more when we should be doing work more efficiently and better and have more focus and more intention. And it should be more about the work getting done rather than the hours that we're putting into it, right? And that was within the context of working in the gym. But the question on social media that someone asked you is, how do I transfer that over into learning and using my brain? Where are the diminishing returns in, if I have all this time to read and listen to podcasts and take courses and go to school and learn from smart people, how do I do that better instead of more? You know, if I don't want to spend 10 hours learning and reading and applying and going to classes and taking tests, I want to maximize my ability to learn and take in information, synthesize it, yeah. be able to use so it later. There's a lot there. But the first thing is culture is selling you hard work, right? They're selling you this glamorization of hard work. You know, we have this mentality of, of uh, factory workers, right? We want everyone to, oh, you got to crush it, man. You know, the smartest entrepreneurs I know work the least. And this paradigm around, oh, you got to work hard is, in my opinion, being sold to you by, maybe it's large corporations, maybe it's government, maybe it's whoever, but it's absolute nonsense. Like, having to work hard is relative in certain things. Like, as a professional bodybuilder, you got to work hard. But how often, right? How long? So it's learning to do these intense sprints of, like, I'm going to work my ass off for the short amount of time. And it's not even hard, it's focused. But the key, then, that's missing there is focusing on the right things, which is what you're saying. So how do you learn to focus on the right things, and how do you learn to condense down the information? Well, the simplest thing that comes to mind, as far as, you know, taking another step back to perhaps specifically address your question, if I have all this information I want to learn, you have to look at ways to condense time. If it takes me 8 to 10 hours to read a book, which is typical, well, is there a way that I can get that information in less time? And that's from the smartest people I've ever met. That seems to be something they're very, very good at. It's finding ways to curate. So, you know, you talk about speed reading. You talk about the exclusive reason I started the podcast was exactly that. I don't tell the people that, but it's like, I want to condense time. So rather than reading this eight to 10 hour book or spending you know, weeks reading this person's information, I just call them and go, hey, man. Do you want to have a 90 minute conversation with everything that's going on in your brain? And that's it. And that's the beautiful opportunity that this podcast has provided me. So condensing time looks like what? If I want to learn how to build muscle, I could spend six months reading textbooks and searching the internet and taking buying online courses and watching videos. Or I could just go and go, well, who's the best in the world at this? And I'm going to go hire him or I'm or her. And I'm going to go to the course and I'm going to go meet them in person or I'm going to, you know, become a member of their members group and, and, you know, literally it's this mentorship thing, right? Like, how do I dive in deep into their world? I think most people don't do that. Most people will stick their big toe in. I'm just going to read one article and now I'm an expert, right? It's the Dunning-Kruger effect, whereas like people, when they just learn a little bit, think they know everything. And then they realize when they start to learn a bit more that they know absolutely nothing. That's, you know, honestly where I feel pretty much every day in my life (laughs) to meet these experts I was like, oh man, you know so much. I'm like, man, you just got to hear this person I just talked to today. Like, fuck, they know everything. And I feel like (laughs) they won't give me, they won't put a term on it. A constant learner. Yeah, yeah. well, I feel like a mental midget sometimes. But hey man, at least I'm surrounding myself with people. And my desire to learn is voracious. But anyway, so it's this concept around condensing time is how can you find mentors to curate your information? How can you find resources that allow you to accelerate the process of remembering and applying this stuff, right? You can spend four years going to university, or you can spend six months diving into the exact topic you want to do, but focus is important. So why don't you, before you go into questions, I interrupted your talking about the muscle. Sucked. No, I'm kidding. It was great. It was yeah. fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> like, and you're fired. Get out of here. No, I want to, and I'm planning on, with your permission, I'm going to write, because I'm a writer, so I'm a talker too, but I want to write down my thoughts and maybe put that into something that could either go up online or somewhere so that people can, can get at least my perspective on it. But it's interesting because the things that are sticking with me from this three-day camp, and I'm so grateful that I got to it, and I feel like I learned so much, so I appreciate you letting me kind of tag along 
But the things that I gained the most from it are things that I already knew, but I needed an environment to internalize it and really do it. You know what I mean? Like, I think there are so many. many so the mind muscle connection thing, right? Like anybody who's been in bodybuilding forever, anytime knows that you want a mind muscle connection when you're lifting a weight, you want to be able to connect your brain to the muscle that you're trying to contract and work and grow. I hate that term. Okay. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It is a term that means nothing now because no one knows what that actually means or knows how to do it, or they'll say that that's what they're going into the gym to do and they're not doing it. There were so many times throughout these three days that there were things that the coaches were telling me that you were saying that I was like, yeah, yeah, I know that's, that makes sense. But why am I not thinking that and internalizing it and actually doing it when I'm in the gym? So anyway, there were some cues and stuff we were doing the squat day and I did quad dominant squats for the first time in my life because I'd never done them before because I didn't think that I had physiology for it. I thought, okay, I squat with my butt out first and I do all like posterior chain and glutes. I'm never going to do quad dominant squats because that's not how my body's set up. And with some help and some cues and some wedges and stuff, so we had those working, cues like set yourself up, be stable, contract your muscles before you start moving. I mean, again, these are all things that looking back, I'm like, this is common sense. You should be stable. You should feel stable and strong in a position before you move. You know, you should pull your body down to the bottom of the squat rather than fall and try to get yourself back up. These are things that I like am ashamed that I'm not thinking about when I'm in the gym every day, doing it for 15 years. Nobody is, right? It, exactly. It's, not, it's very simple, but it's not easy. It's the mindfulness. And you say this word, we both say this word a lot of times during the day. And that, that's the problem with trying to impart simple knowledge so repetitively that it starts to maybe sound like nothing after a while, but it matters. It matters that mindfulness and sitting in it and thinking about it and really thinking and then implementing instead of just going and then thinking later, like that stuff really matters. Again, like you're kind of smiling at me because the stuff sounds like dumb common sense, but it's no, not. No, I'm not smiling you because it's not like common sense. <laughs> I'm smiling you because that's the realization I'm hoping people have. Right? Yeah. It's like stuff is so easy. What's the first thing I said? You weren't there when I started the camp. First thing I said when we started the camp is, this stuff is very easy. What's going to prevent you from progress is what you think you know mm -hmm. about exercise. Mm -hmm. So I started to pay attention and start to feel. And it's so simple, but yet we think we know what we're talking about. Everyone you, you talk to says, I don't know. You know, oh, you don't. Like, you suck. Not you, but most people yeah. suck. And you go, oh, I'm pretty good. You know, I know what I'm doing. Man, you really don't. And the margin for progress is huge with just really, really minute changes. Because most people are directing tension away from the muscle they're trying to train, or their, their body is naturally trying to cheat because that's where evolutionary evolved to do. And all we have to do is, is pay attention enough to, to kind of just nudge it back on course. And it's, it's very simple, it's just not easy. And this is why I think it's so unique and important, the approach that you have to muscle building, which is a holistic one that's about using your brain and using your ego to your own advantage instead of letting it run your life, right? We've talked about that in, past, in past, um podcasts as well, because all of us in there were doing movements with zero weights and we we're dying. And we were doing bicep curls with five pounds and we were squatting with zero weight. And this isn't just me, this is dudes in there that spend all day in the gym lifting the heaviest weights that they can. And they came here and were very humbled. And the fact that you brought together a group of people who are willing to do that is special. But it's so important to be able to disconnect your ego from trying to better yourself. Because if you rely on it, like the ego tells you that you know things already, and the ego tells you that you're strong already, and then you go in there and you're like, actually, no, not even close. But our ability to do that is really important. And I wonder, how can we continue to do this? Because I can't come to a muscle camp every weekend. So how can I continue to have that really, really clear ability to connect and be mindful sure. of the gym. The first thing I want to say is the intention is not to do it light, right? The intention is to do it heavy or ultimately appropriately. But most people, when you actually use the muscle you're trying to train, don't, can't use weights. So we're just using appropriate weight, weights with the intention of progressing. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, it's presence, right? It's learning to be present when I walk into the gym. Most people go into the gym and they're going in to do what? They're going in to get it done. They're good because they have to, right? And that's just not the right mentality. And the other thing that people do very incorrectly is attempting to do or setting the objective to do so many things. Like, hey, I'm going to the gym today, 
Flex Magazine or Muscle Fitness says, I need to do at least six exercises for this body part because that's what this body part used to do. And if I want to build this body part, you got to do this much, and then I'm going to do this much cardio, and do, you know, this many other things, and I can do that for two hours. It's absolute nonsense. Why? Because you suck at everything. Most people aren't very good at the things they're doing. So rather than doing six things you suck at, why not do two things and get really, really good at them and actually get some effort and directed attention on those two things, or, or maybe it's three things, and really, really focus on them so you can actually direct that tension, master that skill, and now, okay, now you're a master of those two things, let's add one more, right? And now, so we're slowly building that circle of comfort, and that's where magic happens, right? So if I can get really good at something to the point I can do it unconsciously, and now I can work hard, and now I can get strong, and now I'm not going to be injured. Oh, now I'm getting progress. And that's why you have people who come into my world who make so much progress, you know, exponentially more than you would think they're going to, just because I force them to not use the Rico. And like my sometimes little jabs, I'm like, hey, stop doing that, stop doing that, stop doing that. That's my jab if they're unconscious. Because like so many people are unconsciously moving things. They're unconsciously acting, they're unconsciously living their life. Mm-hmm. So I'll often throw something in there that's a pattern interrupt that be like, hey, dummy, wake up. Like, what? What do you say? Yes, pay attention. <laughs> and and then they focus. The yeah, and then they focus and you're like, okay, I got their attention and now maybe they'll do what I'm asking them to do. Is there a bit of an oxymoron here between, you know, you talked about the unconscious confidence thing and I, I think that most of your listeners can get their heads around working towards mastering something so that you're doing it properly without thinking about doing it, right? Mm-hmm. But by nature of what you're talking about with the yeah, tension and this and the being present and the mindfulness in the gym, can you go in there and be fully present and mindful and have that tension and have that proper movement and have that proper breathing and be fully focused in there and be doing that unconsciously? No. So there's many facets to every skill, right? So there's one skill that maybe just not moving, like we showed you on, on the last day. It was like the idea of being able to not move in and of itself is a skill. So pre- this idea of preventing extraneous motion, that's a skill. Then there's a skill component of like actually doing the movement through this particular plane of motion and making that natural and comfortable. Then there's the skill of, well, can I keep my mind on this thing and actually focus on it and pay attention to how much tension is there and can I increase the tension? Then there's the skill of, can I actually breathe? And then there's the skill of, can I do this hard and increase the load, right? It's this always kind of like unraveling the layers of the onion. And so for me, it's just always kind of cycling through them. There really isn't an aspect of, well, there is maybe this, this intention to get to mastery, but there's always certain things that you're going to come back to. Because as I focus on one for a long time, something else falls off. And I focus on another one, something else falls off. And it's always this, this circuitous desire to chase perfection. It doesn't happen, but there's only a small number of things that you need to be focusing on, right? And if you can make the movement part rather secondary, that allows you to shift toward like, hey, I'm actually going to focus on hard work now. I could focus on my breathing. I could focus on making my breathing more effective to make my performance more effective, right? Can't get someone who can't do the skill. Like, I'm not going to tell you to you know squat while holding your breath and doing isocods at the same time. Like, there's just going to be sequential. Another end quote from the weekend that is sort of like a, yeah, no shit, but people still aren't doing it, (laughs) that I really liked, was it's not about moving the weight, it's about contracting the muscle, right? So that's why you go back, like you said, like, yeah, the ideal thing is that you're lifting lots of weights, but really it's like you have to do the work, you have to contract the muscle first and what weight you're using doesn't matter. And a couple of the trainers were saying something similar, like we want 10 pounds to feel like a hundred pounds, like 500 pounds, because it's about your ability to contract the muscle and your ability to find tension and find stability and all of those things. So the weight should be secondary. It's really about the work that you're doing. Sure. And the weight matters, right? But you don't realize that you can create a significant amount of internal tension. So the tension and torque is what matters. The weight doesn't matter, right? Ultimately. But Tension and torque is what matters. And eventually, you need resistance to create that internal response, that internal torque and tension we talked about. But uh, that's what's missing is people just don't understand how to create tension and torque. Most people think load is the only thing that matters. But as we very clearly showed during the course, load is only one very, very small percentage, right? So, you know, there's time, there's distance, which most people don't ever think about. Those are very, very important. And, 
and obviously directing that load matters too because my body naturally wants to distribute load to as many muscles as possible and my body also wants to use momentum to move this thing and your body's going to launch it where it feels like this thing's heavy and maybe you use a little bit of muscle contraction where the exercise is relatively easy and then maybe you catch it again at the bottom somewhere right? and that's how most people exercise it. it's so inefficient like this is why most people need five or six exercises to, in a workout to get into hip stimulation because they all suck and if i'm getting 10 percent or less efficiency during an exercise well why don't just get 100 percent efficiency or as close to it as you can and do less you know, I often talk about that. I've talked about this in the podcast a number of times. You know, if I find an exercise that works for me, that feels great, and I know that I have tension through the entire, to kind of quantify what it would qualify, I guess, what a good exercise is. It means, well, does it fit my body? Does it offer full range challenge? Meaning, challenge me in every aspect of the range. And if it does, well, then I'm going to do a lot of it because I know that's really, really efficient and effective. So, like an example, the lying leg curl we have here, I'll do. Correct. I'm training hamstrings like minimum. I'm doing six sets. I'm going to do eight. I'm going to do ten. I'm going to do twelve. When I was competing, I would do more. Go, Why do you do so many? Because it works. And rather than going and doing deadlifts and seated leg curls and these other exercises that people try to come up with, like standing on a ball upside down and rubbing your wing, wiggling your nose, I'm just going to do the ones that work. And that's what gets results. So people go bad hamstrings with your legs. Well, to be honest, I did a lot of hack squats. I did a lot of squats and a lot of legs and a lot of lunges. Not much else. And just get really good at them. And within that, you change the, the parameters, right? You change the loading parameters. And you change, you know, some days I'm doing sixes, and some days I'm doing 15s, and some days I'm doing 20s, and some days I'm doing eights, and, and all these. And then you, so you can vary the amount of reps. You can vary the tempo. You can vary the time between sets. You can vary the exercise combinations. You can vary so much. The amount of time between workouts. Like what if, you know, Monday, I, this week I'll do Monday and Thursday legs. Next week I might do Monday and Wednesday. It just changes. And, and nothing is right or wrong. It's all just a novel stimulus. And then you look at why well, create this stimulus. What is the response I get? And how long does it take me to recover from that response? And is it appropriately moving me in the right direction? So rather than being dogmatically and myopically attached to some particular way of doing it, I just literally realize that my body responds to stimulus. My body responds to stress. So I'm going to create a new stress, a novel stress, and see, well, how did I respond to this? If I respond well, let's try something similar. Maybe a little bit different, but it's always just this simplifying and novel stimulus. The internal tension ability to, to create tension without regard necessarily to the load, I think, is one thing that was really interesting to me. It's maybe because I come from like a CrossFit and then powerlifting background, so things are a little bit different. But even with a squat, when you're descending in a squat, I know that there has to be some tension. I'm not falling down to the bottom and then just hoping that I bounce back up. But the cues that you were giving me to like use my hamstrings and the muscles in my posterior chain to pull yourself down, to actively pull yourself down to the bottom of a squat, I literally never thought about squatting like that. And it made squatting so much more stable, but so much harder. Like I was doing these like 10 sets of very slow controlled with the breathing, 10 reps of a body weight squat. And I was like breaking out into a sweat. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. Well, it's, it's the true definition of an eccentric, I guess, right? It's like actually using your muscles on the way down rather than just letting something fall on the way down is the definition of an eccentric. And most people get it. So I'm actually, you know, to just give people a visual example of what it is, stop at the top of a squat or begin at the top of a squat, and my quads actually remain contracted. So I'm actually trying to keep them tense by shoving to the floor. I don't let that relax. I consciously use my hamstrings and my hip flexors to pull me down. It just completely changes, as you say, the stimulus because that ability to maintain the pelvic stability because of my quads and my abs being engaged allows me to have so much more stability, so much more, and I'm able to add so much more load to the bar, which is way more challenging but again that's skill right that's just skill and eventually give it three four weeks and eventually that, your body makes that skill unconscious and now we can add more resistance and now we can add a different dimension of challenge even the concept of internal and external stability and those being two separate things that are used sometimes for different reasons was something that i had never considered and i think one of the sort of next level kind of tweaky parts of being a good bodybuilder that i i had not ever incorporated and again maybe this is the fault of coming from like a powerlifting background was i realized that we all have different bodies and so different machines or lifts or positioning is going to work for different people but i always assumed you find the one that works for you and then that's it like you don't play with anything else 
but knowing that there are external tools and ways to stabilize yourself that allow you to get into positions that maybe aren't positions that you would naturally get into. Yeah. And if you have that internal stability and that um, those that sort of mindfulness to move your body through that range of motion in a safe way, you can do things that maybe you didn't think that you could do. I think it's important to clarify that people understand that stability does not mean standing on most of all, right? Like yeah. you don't develop stability that way. It's very important that you have a stable platform. Stability, stability in and of itself means not moving, not adding some extraneous means of, of adding instability, and it's not the same thing. But yeah, there's certainly ways to manipulate your structure, and we that's the first thing we talk about in campus. Everybody's built differently, and we need to acknowledge that we find what works for us, and we could probably make you fit into most things. If we just forget what we think we know and we just look and we go, hey, gosh, this is how you should train this for your body. Can you see that? And you go, oh, that's pretty obvious if I just took it for a while. One kind of cool thing, too, that sort of taught that I had never considered before is the concept of stability from the top down as well as from the bottom up. So when we were doing the hamstring curl, which is a machine that I normally hate and don't do because... Now I realize I was doing it incorrectly, but I wasn't able to kind of recruit the right muscles because I was doing it wrong. But one of the ways that they were putting me on this machine and I was stabilizing from the core and from my shoulders and bringing my lats down and putting my body in a position that was relative and it was appropriate relative to the machine, right? I know this is hard because people are listening and not seeing it, but you don't just lie down on a hamstring curl and just kind of curl away. Like you have to set your body up in a in a way, you don't? You're yeah, exactly. what do you mean? Exactly. But people don't know that. Like you don't get people don't know that. You go into a machine, you see what's laid out there, you lie down on it, you hope that you're set up in the right way, and you lift a weight and you hope for the best. But literally, there were a few. And that's, and that's why people can't put muscle. And they go, "I have a really hard time building." This. No, you don't. You don't have a hard time. Building just not anything. doing it you're right. Just not doing it right. Yeah, but this is stuff that some of these things we're all different in our journey, and some of us are more critical thinkers than others. And I like to think that I don't just blindly flail around in the gym, generally speaking. <laughs> Maybe seeing the gym, I'm just like flail around. But that, that hamstring, the hamstring curl was a kind of a like light bulb moment for me because I never did them. I hated them. I thought it was just a stupid machine that I didn't like. And then I did it properly <laughs> and I felt my hamstrings work. Right. It was like honestly revolutionary for me, really. There were so many moments during this camp. I know maybe I'm a little bit biased because maybe you're giving me a job here. But, like, <laughs> but truly, I learned so much more than I thought I would, if I'm being perfectly honest right now. Like, I know that you're a big deal. I know that you're good. That people come from all over the world to come to your camps. But I learned more than I thought I would. And I was telling people like when I was kind of downloading after the end of each day, and people were asking me, like, how's it going? I'm like, I'm literally going to change everything I'm doing in the gym when I leave here. I really am. Like, yeah. first of all, my weights are going down the tube. I'm just taking all the weights Temporarily. off. Temporarily. Yeah. Temporarily, yeah. fine. I'm at an age now where I'm like, okay, with that, I don't really give a shit if people are like, how come she's not using the heavy weights anymore? What happened to her? Like, I don't really care. Especially if it means I'm going to get, like, huge gains and I'm going right. to get bigger muscles now because I'm doing it properly. Yeah. And less um, time. Yeah. Less joint pain. Yeah. I'm literally going to go back to the gym and for the first time in probably a decade, I have learned things that are going to fully change the way I approach women in the gym. That's very kind. It's a big deal. It's a big deal for me. Yeah. I think people need to acknowledge that muscle building is simple and they can do it and it doesn't need to be painful. Like, And I really believe that if you do it correctly, injuries are eliminated. There shouldn't be a time when you ever get hurt in the gym and your joints shouldn't hurt after you train. That, that realization for people is big. And like most people kind of think, oh, you know, shoulder pain, elbow pain is kind of part for the course of the gym. It's absolutely not. It's just you're doing things wrong. And I don't care if you've been training for 25 years because we have people, I have people who've been training for longer than that come into my, into my world and go, holy smokes, man, like, you know, I've been doing this for this long as a professional bodybuilder at this low, high level bodybuilder, and this completely revolutionized what I'm doing. And it's, and again, I don't claim this to be Ben's way, right? This is just correct. And, and I tell you who my mentors are and people who have taught me everything I know. And you know, I stand on the shoulder of giants. I just have this unique perspective of you know having the theory or a good percentage of the theory, not nearly as much as many people, and the application. And that's where I differentiate myself is that I push this you know harder than most humans ever will or ever could. I can see where it's going to break. You know, I've tested everything. Oh, you know, you got to lift heavy. I'm like, well, I tried that for a long time, and here's what I saw. Well, this works. So I tried that too. You know, having been a professional bodybuilder for ten years or longer, I tried everything. And try to work with every coach and every trainer, and like I've tried everything. And they go, Well, after looking through all those things and working with now thousands and thousands, if not millions of people around the world, I can tell you what works and I can tell you what doesn't work. And it's so much more simple than people.
the thing. People are all chasing this. I need, to, I need to do program. Or I need to periodize my, my stimulus. I'm like, none of that shit matters until you first master the stimulus, right? You have to qualify it before you can quantify it. And that's a quote I use often that I think is extremely useful and practical, right? It's like, how do I know that you know, if I'm doing one rep and another rep, that it actually equals two reps? Or is it like a half a rep and maybe a third of a rep? It doesn't make sense. So I need to make sure that I'm getting the maximum amount of stimulus out of every single inch of every single rep first, and then I can actually quantify it. How interesting that the bend way just happens to coincide with the right way. You're like, it's not my way, it's just the right way. Right. <laughs> it just happens that they're the same thing. What a coincidence. Well, because I take an unbiased approach, right? Yeah. It's like I'm just looking for the right answer. Yeah. I'm not looking to make it mine or be a, a, attached like nutrition. Like eventually Ben's way will be the right way too. I'm just not there yet. I'm just looking at genetics and how that overlaps with specific training. It overlaps with stimulus. It overlaps with mechanics. It overlaps with all these different things that, that go into building a body. And then with nutrition, it's the same thing. It's like, I don't know yet, but I don't think anybody does. And when somebody does, and I don't think we're that far off, well, now we'll just go, okay, hey guys, this is how you do it, right? And this is the overlap of your environment and the genetics and then excuse me, internal environment of your microbiome and your autonomic nervous system, and how all of those things interplay to me actually should eat these foods, mm -hmm. right? I, I think, you know, realistically, I hope 10 years, in 10 years or less, we should be able to, to effectively eat perfectly for our genetics and our environment. And I hope somebody out there listening is thinking of developing some type of artificial intelligence where I can literally input my biological data from today and it goes hey man you should eat this today and then because we're human beings we will still choose to eat otherwise sure because that's how we do things sure but at least you're getting the foundational nutrients that you need right that's how i approach it it's like am i getting the things i need to make my brain work well mm -hmm. to make my muscles work well to make my heart work well you know, all my cells work well and that's the foundation if you have that if you want to eat some Peanut butter on top of it. Let's, let's bacon, go to town. Bacon and freeze dried liver that was maybe, may or may not have been dog food that I ate while I was here because there's a lot of cute dogs. They shared their liver with me while I was here. I'm it, not going to say no. I think it's really disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> you say it with love, right, Ben? That I was eating dog food. Hey, liver is liver, okay? This was just liver that was brought in for a dog to eat. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's been. I don't know, I don't know it's it's fine. It's fine. Let's not speculate. As long as you feel good about it, you didn't. Get I feel great about it. I, I went in and crushed the workout. And I will say, just before we end, because I know this has gone longer than we meant it to, but there really is a magic to for meatheads and bodybuilders who love to be in the gym. There really is something magic about being in this gym and in a gym like this where there are so many educated, intelligent, passionate meatheads in here, right? Like they love to be in here just lifting heavy weight and grunting and sweating, but they're intelligent and smart and helpful and passionate about what they do. And it's like, it really has me fired up this week to be in here working out. Thanks, Ash. And even more than that, I'll tell you the thing that is kind of the number one hiring criteria for me is they have to care. Because I feel as though the reason that I'm a successful coach or anything is because I actually give a shit about people getting results. And that's what separates me apart from most people. Is most people are doing it for money and most people are doing it for variety and thing. And like I told you numerous times, I don't want any of that stuff. Like you know, money is great so I can have freedom and be able to have and your and face on it. Has my face on it. But you have to care. So any of the coaches out there who are having a hard time building their business or building their client list or whatever it may be, go within yourself and find out, do you actually give a shit about them? Do you give a shit about the results? Like, I often don't take clients on because I care about their results more than they do. That's a problem to me. Like, that's part of my, my onboarding criteria. If I have the sense that I'm going to care about you getting results more than you do, I'm out. And I think that's an important stipulation or understanding for any business owner out there to have. It's like, you have to care about the outcome. Um, there's people out there that are smarter than me. There's no question. But if they don't care, you're not going to get the same results because I have to believe in you. You have to believe in yourself and I have to care about your results and that's everything. So, yeah. Anyway, so the one thing we didn't do yet is, is our habit. And I think, so last week we had people on declutter their house and I hope everybody did something to declutter because I think that's awesome. And this week, I think the theme of my life and, and everyone that comes into my life is there's no complaint. Always looking for the gratitude in something. And so the theme of this week, the habit of this week that I hope each and one and every one of you guys is able to apply for the rest of your life is stop being a victim and stop complaining. Com 
playing ultimately is a victim attitude, right? And I think if people want to change their life, the number one thing you need to do before anything else matters is start taking ownership for everything. And complaining is, by definition, making it. So I hope that we can all this week, for 24 hours a day, for seven days, we're going to pay attention to what are we complaining about? And is there a need to complain about it, right? And, you know, there's the answer is always no, isn't it? Always no. Yeah. And really, even if there are people like, oh, well, what if this happens? There's a way to do things in life that aren't, that is not complaining, but still stating fact. Like, hey, I got a, I have a bug in my foot or something. It's not so complaining. It's just an obvious fact. I'm like, oh my God. Right? Like, I just I complain. Like bleep bugs, so they bleep bugs. Sure. I think it's. Yeah. But yeah. Guys, it just it's doesn't fix the problem, is the no. thing. We, we talked about this offline, too. Like, power. There's nothing wrong with. You, it's a human reaction to be upset when shitty things happen or if something but happens it doesn't, outside need, your it's not, it doesn't need to be. No, I'm just saying it, not everyone is able to not have a reaction the way you do, okay? So I'm saying it's okay. Why not? Let me just explain. Let me just so explain. you're already rationalizing people's shit. No, behavior. I'm absolutely not because let me finish what I'm saying here. If you get hit by a car tomorrow, you're allowed to think that was fucked up that that happened. But to complain, like, I got hit by a car, now I just have to, I'm going to get fat, and I can't work out, and everything's terrible, and I'm in pain, and, like, why did this happen to me? That is not helping you. What is helping you is figuring out how to get healthy as fast as possible, and what to eat to recover, and how to take care of yourself as best you can, and get back in the gym when you can. It's the, for me, like, we talk about this, it's being action-oriented. Yeah. Complaining is never about an action. You're never doing anything when you're complaining. You're just sitting there complaining. So it's okay in your head to feel like, man, that thing was fucked up that happened to me. But complaining doesn't fix it ever. It's never in the history of the world fixed a problem. So instead, just use it. Use it and do something with it. I'm just being like the human side of this bed and saying that people are still going to have emotional reactions. And sometimes you are still going to think, why me? But putting that out into the world isn't going to fix it. So there's literally no point. I just, don't, I just don't like to accept or acknowledge the rationalization of sometimes it's okay. Because then people fucking rationalize everything. I'm not saying it's okay to complain. I'm just saying it's okay to have an emotional sure, response. Sure, of course. But I just don't want the, the audience to take it as sometimes it's okay to, because it's fucking not. It doesn't accomplish anything. No one likes a and, complainer. And Tony Robbins, one of the things he can put into my head is the reason people don't succeed is because they soften or they rationalize, right? You soften. So oh, it's not so bad. Oh, like, no, man, like, if you're going to change your life, get rid of the victim attitude, get rid of the complaining. That's the end of the episode. I hope you guys are having an amazing day. I hope you love hearing Ashley and I ramble about her camp experience this week. And I hope you guys apply the habit of the week. Stop complaining. All right, guys. Have a wonderful day. If you enjoy the podcast, as always, share it with at least one person you know and love that will love the muscle intelligence message. Have an amazing day. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.